uh, in case you don't know who I am, especially for you, Mike, I'm Joe Thompson, president <laughs> of your World Series champion, Houston <laughs> Astros. Chapter. I got the shirt and I had to prove it. <laughs> Bill and I was uh, talking about something interesting today. Uh, well, just a few minutes ago, I saw something on Facebook. Uh, Carlos Beltran is eligible for the Hall of Fame next year, yep. and they have already started. Yep. The first member of the 2017 Astros, does he deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? And I asked Bill, does he even have the numbers to get in the Hall of Fame anyway? But you know what the story is going to be, of course, right? So we have that. We can talk about it at a later time, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to celebrate our Astros and remember an Astros legend. Well, not remember. You, you haven't gone away, but you're here. <laughs> All right. Yes. Jose Cruz. You're absolutely right. To be continued, though. <laughs> Um, we have a lot of uh, guests tonight. Uh, if you're on uh, Zoom and you're a guest, really? Is that who I think it is? Yeah, it is. That is? Oh, my goodness. All right, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed now. But, <laughs> but uh, if you're a guest, if you've never been here before, welcome. Uh, if I don't say your name, please tell us who you are. Uh, we have Frank Plute, right? Just like Pluto, but without the O. Frank Plute, right? And you're a guest of Ralph Morgan, who was a guest of Mike. Right? I, 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 I say that, Mike, because he said, you know, this Mike's not with me today, right? <laughs> Nick Clark and Marina. Shulman, right? Wife of uh, former chapter member Gary Shulman, right? Right. So welcome, both of you. Welcome. We're all family here. I mean, really. Um, anybody else that I forgot? Anybody online? Ben, I see it. Sure. Right. Uh, Joe, John Atkins. Oh, man, yeah, I'm sorry, John. That's all right. John Atkins, who I met through Ted. I really like John because he invited my wife and I. What was it game one of the ALCS thing? Yeah, so uh, John, lifelong friend, right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we won. Yes, we won. Right, we won. Um, Ted, I guess we can ask at a later time. But do the Astros qualify as a dynasty now, Ted? Yeah, you probably would know more than anybody else. I I think so. Yes. <laughs> under my under my test, which requires two years in a row, they're gonna they're gonna win next year. So they're they're yeah, definitely okay. all right. All right. Uh, real quickly, yeah. Real quickly, uh, I also saw some other stuff online. We could talk maybe a little bit very briefly. Verlander to the Mets is a rumor. Look around out there. What do y'all think of that? Don't see it. I see him going to California if he doesn't resign here. Okay. You got to get close to the bottom. Goodbye. Goodbye. He's got his two rings, right? Um, on the 16th, uh, just a couple of days ago, we had a regional chapter uh, leaders meeting um, where a few of us around the country talked about different things. Basically, what a chapter can do to qualify the all-star or MVP status or good or Bob and I was talking about some of the stuff. It's, you know, that was basically what we could do as chapters to qualify as this status and that status. There's a couple of things. Um, I'm really going to talk about it much today because of who's here, because of the schedule, but we can talk about at a later time. Some of the stuff we could do as a chapter to engage more with, uh, engage more with the city. A lot of things we can do. Uh, there's a local grants program that's coming out that Saber has that we could possibly do some stuff. Another research project. If any of y'all remember how long ago when we did the book? How long ago? 2014. 2014, when as a chapter we got together 
and uh, wrote a history of baseball before the Astros, going back to the Civil War all the way up. So maybe something like that we could even talk about maybe doing in the future. In case you don't know, and I'm bringing this up because Sabre badgered me and badgered me, emailed me almost every day, renew your membership. Mm -hmm. I finally did today. So uh, please renew your membership if, you, if your membership is about to expire. Uh, if you haven't joined yet, one of our guests, uh, hopefully after today you'll be so excited you'll get home and join. But uh, if you haven't renewed, you can set it up to auto renew too, right, Bob? Will be automatically renewed unless you say no. So okay. a lot of us, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. A couple of days ago, if you have not read it already, we have a brand new edition of the chapter newsletter. We have a lot of great stories in this chapter newsletter. Um, I'll say the least for last, but thanks to Tony and Scott for putting another another great newsletter. Tony, point at Scott. Scott is the man. Not only did he put the newsletter together, he wrote a great story about the recap for the Astros this previous uh, year. So, um, Brownie wrote another edition, or is it the final edition? <laughs> we think so. Uh, Life of Cal. Life and career of Cal. Ever say never. Uh, I don't know. John Wood. John Wood? President uh, Emeritus Bob wrote a great story about his center field idols. Right? Uh, Jimmy Wynn. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you wrote a uh, great story about solo homers. All right. And uh, Herb, you wrote about the automated strike zone. And the least, most popular, I would say, the least, you know, the, probably the worst story in the entire newsletter is my message. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> About the baseball bucket list, right? It is because of Saber that I've had the, the, the experience to meet all of you great people and travel all over the country and go all of these great parks. And I just tell you a little bit about it. So if you haven't joined Saber or if your membership is about to expire, just think of all the great benefits traveling around the country. With a lot of people you know have a lot of things in common and seeing great things. Because of Saber, I went to Camden Yards in August. You know, also went to Ripken Field, you know, stuff like that. I went to PNC Park a couple of years ago. But uh, I've been to, I don't even know what the ballpark in Spokane is. That in the 90s, I went and saw the Spokane Indians. We still haven't figured out who they were affiliated with back in the late 90s. But uh, I've been there. So, uh, yeah, give it a read if you uh, have a little extra time. But it, it really, it's the worst story in the new book. And send us some stories. And say, yeah, and finally, send us some more stories because we're already talking about the next newsletter. We'll come out in February, right? Right around spring, so that's March. Yeah. Or February, early February. End of January, early February. No okay. Um. All right, very quickly on November the 12th, we had another Saturday morning get together and talk session. I thought it went pretty good. It was really a celebration of the Astros and, you know, stuff like that. We had a couple of other, you know, people join in and talk. So if you, you know, if you're, if you're online or if you're watching this recording and you don't have a chance to show up on Monday night or even Zoom in or something like that, and you're watching, if Saturday's a better day for you, we're having another Saturday session on December the 17th, we will also meet the newest chapter members. The last time we had a meet the chapter members event, um, on a Saturday, we met Patrick, right? All right, we met you. So uh, we're having another one on Saturday, December 17th, starting at 11 o'clock in the morning. So uh, these things are pretty popular, I think. So we may this just may be a normal thing we do on Saturday morning. Uh, so... You don't have to be a member of the chapter. So if you know somebody, invite them up. 
It's less formal, of course. We just do a lot of talking about baseball. Speakers for next month. Um, Tony Adams. Anybody ever heard that name? Stealingscandal.com. He's a member of this chapter. He lives in Houston. He's the data guy who listened to eight over 8,000 at bat or 8,000 pitches, and he logged every time he heard a trap campaign. So he will be our guest next month. Um, he says this, I'm an Astros fan. To understand the scope of the Astros cheating and the players involved, I logged every trash can bang from every Astros 2017 home game with video available. Over 8,200 pitches watched and over 1,100 trash can bangs found. Here's the results. I could talk about, this is what he's going to talk about. I could talk about his story and the process he went through. Um, and uh, he's going to log in, use a monitor. And for the first time, he'll connect a laptop and show us how he logged the banks. He's never shown this live. So please show up next month. You'll see how the guy came up with his data. I have a lot of questions for him. You know, but hey, I've talked to him on Twitter. Message, he's a great guy. He, he, he really is. So should be interesting. He's a hobby. Yeah, he's a hobby. <laughs> One of those data guys. But that's okay. So, hey, you know. But like you said, he is an Astro fan. We'll also hear from David Vaught, professor of history at Texas A&M. He's just released a new book, or a new book that's coming out, about Gaylord Perry. It's called Spitter, Baseball's Notorious Gaylord Perry. So he's going to talk to us about 10 minutes next month about his new book. That seems to be the theme of next month, right? <laughs> In January of next year, we'll have uh, January 16th, Allison Footer. Right, will join us. Okay. But without further ado, I'm going to shut up. That's right. Happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays. Sit down, Joe. Um, I, I forgot to uh, uh, announce a very important person. That is the reason I'm standing here today. She keeps me in line. But if you haven't met her, this is my wife, Sue. <laughs> Thank the best for last, right? So without further ado, Bill, I'll let you introduce our guest of honor. Hey, Joe. Thank you. Great to see everybody. And Shirley. Hi, Shirley. <laughs> Shirley, I want you to know that uh, Perry Poole and I have been talking about Bill's coaching and how to slide into the catcher and dislodge the ball. <laughs> Those lessons live on. <laughs> But uh, so glad to see all of you here tonight. It's chilly, really night, but it's kind of, you know, hot stove league time. And nobody uses that term anymore that I think of, but it used to be. What's that? It used to be north in Cincinnati, we'd gather around the, the hot stove. Talk baseball. We don't need that here. But nonetheless, great to see everybody. And it's my pleasure to, well, we have Tal and Terry, so both of our inductees, the yeah. Astros, all of them. And it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Terry, and I had that pleasure already this year. So you may, I, I'm sure all of you are well familiar with his career, but um, we're very pleased to have him, and he's been unable to speak uh, to our group previous years because he's been coaching college at the University of Houston, Victoria, commuting from Houston down there. So that shows you how much he wanted to contribute to the youth of today and, and teach the sport and help out young people for their careers. And that's certainly admirable. He also is working a full-time job, quarter management, helping people with their financial plans the rest of their lives. And uh, so he's making that contribution as well. And I've said this many times, but we're really fortunate as Houston baseball fans to be living in an area where so many players, executives, people associated with the team continue to live here years after they retire. So they're contributing to the community. They're helping the economy. They are uh, doing a lot of things to answer questions uh, about uh, years gone by and, and uh, help people understand the way the game has gone and give it some depth and perspective. And uh, 
fortunate to have that. I remember, Terry, uh, going back to Cincinnati years, we were talking before the meeting tonight about Reds and Astros back in the 70s. He came up, and I certainly remember an opening day home run you hit off Tom Seaver. And I believe that was the Seaver versus J.R. Richard opening day. So I, I know all of it, you know, you're, you're so sick of us broadcasters. Wow, oh, boy, we got opening day. You had a great Hall of Fame pitching matchup. This should be a two to one game. It was, I think, 11 to nine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the way that game started. Terry Poole, home run, right field seats. And uh, you know what he's done in his career, but. Uh, that, that 14 years with the Astros really is one thing that has to be mentioned up front because only Vigio and Bagwell have played longer for the Astros. So with that longevity and, and with the fact that he started so young, coming from Canada, came up through the Astros farm system, learned how to play the game, had excellent coaching. He had Bill Verdon as his manager and also his outfield coach. So that was a, a plus for Kerry, but uh, fundamentally one of the soundest players of his era. Uh, you know, you look at players strike out now or they drop fly balls or they miss the cutoff man. And baseball is a game of mistakes, but the best players eliminate those mistakes. And that's what he did. He just didn't make those fundamental mistakes. It's very well schooled. I'm sure he'll talk about that as he goes through, um, you know, the various facets of his career. But I, I remember all these things about Terry. I remember his speed, his uh, outfield play, you know, he could play all, all the outfield positions and uh, the ability to steal a base, to put down a punt. You know, base running is something he and I were talking about at dinner. And just, you know, he mentioned Pete Rose used to be able to read those hits. And that's, he'd be picking up a ball on one bounce ground. in the outfield, and Terry looks around, and Rose is already almost at third base. Well, he just – Rose wasn't here. that fast, but he had the uncanny ability to read the ball off the Not bat here, and know but... when it was going to be falling in for a hit. So those are the kind of things I mean, that Terry had, too, way, no as a player. It's just such a big part of, of the development of the team, put together by Tal and – and an excellent team in 79. And then in 80, of course, the, the playoff series he had against the Phillies with the 10 hits in, in five games. And, you know, his uh, career playoff average was 370. So, yeah, he was at his best when the games were the most meaningful. Ladies and gentlemen, it's very cool. Um, Good friend of mine said, always bring notes. He says you don't have to read it, but you should always keep it. Just... <laughs> keep them here. First of all, before we start, thanks for the invitation. He doesn't look as uh, interesting group. And before we start, Ms. Burton, good to see you. Greg, good to see you. Greg Lucas. And uh, I don't, I don't know if he's down there or anything, but his name is there. Oh, we did. Uh, I've got a Jose Cruz story for you. Hi, Cherry. I've got to really recognize Jim Smith uh, before we get started. He's got a beautiful jacket on. Today. Ah, uh, no, no, no. You have to stand up again. Just that jacket when when they when they uh, outfitted us to have those uh, done, and uh, it was the most beautiful orange I've ever seen, and the blue the contrast to it, and. And it was such a pleasure to go in with the only executive that I really knew was the Astros. And let me tell you a little story about Tell Smith. So 77 was the year I came up. I came up uh, July. Actually, on my birthday, you called me out on my birthday. And uh, so I, uh, first, first game we playing as the Dodgers. You know, I had to be shaking. It. There was 44,000. I didn't play in front of 4,400. And uh, so, but, so I finished that season. I hit 301. And uh, so we go into negotiations for the next year. First time I ever got to negotiate with hell because John Mullins, the assistant, always took care of the minor league guys or the guys on the 40 man roster. So, Cal gave me his best offer, and we were kind of holding out to see. But he got word back to me that 
I should take his best offer because he could renew me. And uh, so anyways, I took that best offer. We start 78. Now 78, I ended up being on the National League uh, All-Star team. And I still remember it was, it's a Sunday, Sunday game and we have to fly from Houston out to San Diego. I have to uh, fly out there for the game. And, you know, we're hustling after the game. I get in, I've got my first class seat, and I walk up there. Who's sitting in the next seat? Coach, <laughs> 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 it's the hardest three hours I've ever had. <laughs> 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 yeah, I really do appreciate everything that you did for our team. It was, uh, it was fabulous year, fabulous year. I couldn't have, like I said, I couldn't have uh, overjoyed to be part of that, the two of us going in together. That was great. Well, whenever we start these things, I got I, you guys talked a little bit about trivia. Now, I've got a trivia question for you. Now, I can't give much of the information here because there's too much brain power, astral power here. That, so I really got to uh, go real slow with this. Can you name the two former Astros that led the National League and the American League at the same time in home runs? Now, I usually give a lot more information than that. If I give too much information for this group, it's going to go like that. The same year? The same year. They led the National League at one time and the American League at one time. At the same time, I'm starting to give it away a little bit now. Okay, I'll give you one little hint. These guys ended up both playing for the Astros and became roommates for 10 years. Mm -hmm. They led the National League and the American League at home runs at the same time in 78. Mm. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, um, the answer is Craig Reynolds and Terry. <laughs> Tom Seaver and Craig ended up Marsh Langston, I believe, uh, was Seattle when he was over. So we, we figured out that you know, we're, we're asked to <laughs> trip. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had a pleasure to play with so many great players, Houston, so many Hall of Famers. Uh, you know, you start with you know, Joe Morgan, you had. Uh, Don Sutton was there, of course, Nolan Ryan. And I played uh, briefly with Craig Vigio a few years. Right now. Um, but there's the guts of the Astros, Mr. Cruz, you know, that uh, uh, Jose Cruz, he and I were uh, the longest uh, running teammates that I had, 12 and a half years with the Astros. And he lockered lived right there. You know, that's where he was. So Daniel was right next to him, and, uh, and Chael was there. So I, I got to be with these guys for so many years, especially Jose Cruz. Well, in 1980, we go out. It was a uh, uh, mid, mid to the later part of the season. We go to Philadelphia, and Chael's playing left field. Nolan's on the mound, and it's raining. Chael's playing left field. I'm playing right. So Daniel's in center. And so... Uh, there's a runner on second base, and the guy gets a base hit to Cruz in left field. Cruz comes in, Chael comes in, feels the ball, throws it. It goes over Ashby's head, and Nolan's behind goes over his head. So it's flat up against the wall. Nolan grabs the ball, and he shakes his head, walks out. So of course, then the hitter goes to second base on that play. The next pitch, base hit to Jose Cruz out of left field. Here he comes. It's ball, throws the home plate over Ashby's head, <laughs> Noah's head, splat. <laughs> Needless to say, we got blown out in that game. <laughs> but after the game, 
after the game, uh, the bus is really quiet, and you we have Bill Vernon is sitting on the first first seat, and he's waiting. And the last person to get on the bus is Jose Cruz, and he comes on. It's eleven thirty at night. He comes on. He's got black shoes, black pants, black jacket, black cap, and sunglasses. <laughs> he walks on to the bus. And he looks around at everybody and he goes, Jose Cruz strong. <laughs> he was around Jose. He was the guy in the clubhouse that kept everybody loose. You know, he, was, you know, he was just one of those, those uh, credible guys. One of the most, and in my opinion, the most dangerous here in the Oscar uh, Nolan Ryan. You know, can't go through an evening without saying a quick story on Nolan. Nolan was a uh, teammate of mine for nine years, from 80 to 89. Um, but uh, at spring training, at the last week of spring training, all the wives leave. They go to Houston. And uh, we're, we're there. Uh, so I remember Craig Reynolds and I were going to go meet Nolan at the Kissimmee Steakhouse. And so we're on our way, Craig and I are on our way over there. We thought, well, we're a little bit early. Let's swing by and pick up Nolan along the way because he's come to meet us anyways. So we walked and we drove up to his place. And sure enough, his car was in the driveway. So we went up, we knocked on the front door. No answer. The door is locked. So he's, he's got to be here. So we both, Craig and I, walked around to get back. And knocked the door. No answer. Open it while the door is open. So we walk in and we can hear the shower. Well, we know he's coming to meet us. So we go, let's just go on in. And so we went in and, and he had his TV on. And he said, Craig and I said, you know what? He's got to come out. He's going to turn that TV off. So let's hide behind the stairwell. And when he turns that off, we will both jump up and scream. So I'll turn the TV on. And so, yeah, we got in there and, and uh, we were waiting. And then we started thinking, this is stupid. Uh, they, you know, everybody knows Nolan's got guns. <laughs> now we're committed because the shower's off and you know, we're in his house. So sure enough, Nolan comes down. He turns that TV off. Craig and I jump up and scream, don't turn the TV off. Well, he went through the TV. <laughs> People say it throws a 90 mile curveball and 100 mile an hour fasting, but he's scared just like you and I. I take you back a little bit through my career because I, uh, I came through the entire Astro minor league system. Well, uh, went through uh, Covington, uh, Virginia. Uh, Billy Smith was our manager. Was that? <laughs> and Billy was funny. He, he brought everybody to home plate the first day of, uh, that was uh, at Covington. And there's like 35 of us there. And he says, you know, he, he had those chewing, remember, he used to always chew tobacco and everything. He'd be spitting all over the place. And he says, <laughs> he says, now look at everybody here. He says, he says, all of you, you're all the hot shots of the high school and everything. He says, one of you will make it to the big leagues. He was he was almost right. It was Louis Pujols and myself that came out of that. But um, uh, I graduated the next year to a ball. A gentleman named Bob Cluck was there. Bob Cluck was a left-hand pitcher. He just finished his playing career and was coming in there. And and I didn't play that much in the first month. And he inserted me at third base. <laughs> it was late in the ball game. He sort of, and a guy had a sacrifice fly, and I came down home plate, and I completely took out the catcher, and the ball broke loose, and we scored the winning run. And he says, oh, that tough Canadian said, so we got to play him more. Well, by the time the half of the year was up, I made the Midwest League All-Star team. And that was kind of, I got on the map that year. Uh, Pedro Guerrero, you may remember him. He was with the Dodgers that, uh, that time. We were one two in batting average that, uh, the rest of that year. Following year, I got to go to uh, Double A, which was in Columbus, Georgia. Leo Posada was our manager. <laughs> so Leo, 
He, was a, he, he taught me, and I'm telling you, I, I, if I did it once, I did it every day. Because I had to, there was five of us that would go out uh, early at 10 o'clock practice, and then we had to come back for the game. You know, we were so-called the prospects of, the, of that team. And he would make me throw long and get my arm on top to throw and get the backspin. And he'd watch it all the time to make sure I do it. And he did that almost every day. So, so in the minor leagues, uh, you have you have coaches that really install great habits for you. Um, I'm trying to think of who is who is the assistant coach at uh, Covington Tell that you're the uh, uh, he ended up coming to the big leagues, uh, uh, Latin coach. He worked with my swing. Uh, you know, we used to hit balls into the tarp, uh, the thing. But, but you know, we, I would take 200 swings a day just hitting balls into the tarp. And that's what was your minor leagues. That's what you did in the minor leagues. Well, then I, I was at, I was at Columbus for a month and a half. Which I get to move up to, uh, to, uh, uh Charleston, West Virginia. Well, actually, Memphis. We well, we moved to Charleston, but Jim Beecham was there. Jim Beecham was there, and uh, the first day, the first day I go in there, club isn't doing too well. We're playing a double header, and I get to play, and I made a third out at third base. And in between, we lost the first game, and uh, I actually had a pretty good game otherwise. But um, he's walking down, just airing us out in games, and it's. He, he got on the Chaveras or shorts up, and then he walked down and he stops in front of me. He looks at me, he says, and you, pool." He says, he says, you ever make a third out at third base again in your career here? He says, I'll send you back to, to, to Columbus Old Fashioned when I would hit you. You know, I never made a third out. Ever. <laughs> and that's what, that's what it takes is, is good managers like that. Of course, they get moved up to the big leagues. Now I'm dealing with Bill Verde. Mm -hmm. You got to yeah, think about it. This man was a maniac when it came to uh, uh, fungal hitting. And uh, we would go to spring training, and he would take three of us outfielders, and he'd say, wherever, you, wherever I hit the ball, you when you catch the ball, just stay there. I'll move you. And after 20 minutes, I we would come in at the end and just wring our jerseys out, and you'd have to you know, Perspiration would be coming out of it, and 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 he he was he was the one that, about the never missing a cutoff man. It was like, and it was so ingrained in me. If you were ever going to miss, you were going to miss down low, you know, because that just there was nothing that irritated Bill more on than the ball thrown over a cutoff. But it's again the little things in baseball that. Uh, the big things take care of themselves. If the guy can hit, he's going to figure out how to hit. If he can run, he's going to show that he can run. But it's those little things that you, you know, that that's, uh, have great habits. I used to, say, used to love Craig, Craig Vigio. I think one of the greatest stats Craig Vigio ever had was uh, he played one year. He had 600 at-bats. 600 at-bats is a lot. And he... Never hit into one double play that year. That's incredible. You know, for Leo, just incredible. That means he took off as soon as he hit the ball, he was gone. And those are the good habits that you that that I think are you know missing you know uh, in today's game. And uh, what made you know our era play players uh, very you know astute in the game. Um, I saw where John Racinelli, I'm not sure if I'm going see his name, he's going to talk out I am. But he wrote, he wrote a story uh, on uh, Andre Dawson. Andre Dawson was, was uh, intentionally walked five times in one game. It's, a, it's an all-time record. And I read the story today. I went, wow. So Andre Dawson was my favorite player to play games because we go into Montreal and Andre, you know, he could throw a ball better than anybody. You could not take an extra base off him. Well, I went up to Andre one day. See, he had such great bats. He hit that that home run off Frank 40 up in the upper tank that went on the line drive. 
And the next day, we we're out there stretching, and Dave Smith was screaming, Hey, Frank, hey, Frank, we found it. <laughs> <laughs> Montreal, Billy to Mars was the hitting coach over there. And I asked Billy, I said, whenever you're working with Andre Dawson, please let me see him hit in the cage because I want to see the secret of hitting. And, and he says, Terry, he came out, he says, Andre's hitting today early. He says, come on down. So I went down there and I walked up and Andre was hitting balls off the tee. I watched three swings and I walked up. But guy's incredibly strong. I was just, he was the strongest human being you've ever seen. And I asked Andre, you know, what kind of weights did you do? He says, 10 pound weights, Terry. Here, reps here, here, and here. And you know how he was cut. He had that frame. Just an incredible player. But intentionally walked five times one day. There's an extra inning ball game for you. And they won the game. Lou Pinella. Walked in intentionally five times before the uh, I'd like to open it up a little bit to questions, too. Uh, I'm not, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, go ahead. I got a question. A friend of yours who I won't name here said, make sure to ask Terry, do you have a video on your phone, a particular catch that you made in a, in a particular game involving Notre Dame? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen a facing Nolan uh, document. They came and interviewed me on that. And uh, I, uh, I, the first time I showed it to Nolan, I have his catch uh, that I made on Socha. It's a seven billion. That, literally saved that no hitter and but a lot of things about that you know we shifted the social around so i was i was a right fielder i was probably playing more in right center to center fields and, and everybody shifts over and, and Socha hit that ball almost to just right of center field and i caught that ball just as i was going on the work right but anyway i do have that i keep it in and every time i see nolan i say hey nolan I got something he says, you know, I know what you're talking about. Hockey point. Yeah, it's a, a, and you know what's funny about that? That was a game of the week, 1980, wasn't it? The, when he threw this, no, it was 87. But it, it, was a, it was a game of the week in September. Yeah? And uh, he ended up uh, showing up in front of my locker. Ten minutes after the game, I was sitting over there, just cracked a beer with Chael. We were sitting down there and drinking it, and, and Nolan shows up and he, he looked at me and said, TP says, nice catch. You know, watch out. <laughs> 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 Thank you. So are, are good defensive players, can you make them, or is it something within your the, the player's mindset to want to be good defense? I did, you know, a lot of it, I had good speed. Uh, that was the... Uh, so speed makes up for mistakes. So sometimes you don't get a good jump on the ball, but uh, Bill Burton actually showed me how to get a jump on the baseball. He says, when you're playing in center field, you track the ball in. So if the ball is going to the to the right side of the home plate, you're going to start moving that way. That's wherever the ball, because good hitters hit the ball where it's hit, where it's placed, where it's pitched. So if it's thrown away, they'll hit it away. So I'm, I'm literally you know, moving that way. But when you play right field and left field, you do it differently. You watch the pitcher as he's winding up, and when he gets ready to throw the ball, you switch your eyes. You switch your eyes from the pitcher to the hitter. And then uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at that, and I go with the swing. If it looks like he's pulling the ball, you know, you start your crossover step, whichever way it looks like you're going to do it. And that's how you get a better jump. Uh, a lot of players, uh, Bannister, remember uh, – we had Bannister, a pitcher, with us, and he said he loved to watch me play in the outfield because every time a ball was hit up in the air, they looked out there and I was already moving. And you, you, I, I'd have a tendency to do that too when I'm watching games, Dallas. So I, I watch the outfielders and I go like, "That's not a very good job." <laughs> but uh, defensive, you need skills, right? And uh, 
let's say time in your defense spills, and you have to differentiate it from your hitting. How many times have you just seen a guy out there in the outfield going like this? There's they just missed the ball, you know, hitting wise. You have to forget about that. You're now a defense player. It sounds like a basketball mindset, same idea. If you're going to play defense on basketball, you have to want to play defense. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it was good. To, it was pretty good uh, with certain of, uh, of our pitching staff, too. Hardest guy to play for was Bob Nepper. Because Bob Nepper went three and two on every hitter. And you you have to get ready to go on every one. You're exhausted by the time you Getting ready. Nolan was tough to play. No, you know, I guess he went deep into the field. The one thing Nolan told us, he says, you take you you play a little more shallow for me. He said, if they hit it over your head and they hit it out, that's my fault. That was pretty good. You know, you could take that, you know, those I love to take those hits away from Davy Lopes with the Dodger, you know, just <laughs> but I knew he couldn't hit it over my head. <laughs> you know, there's a I would say Phil Garner. Phil Garner was uh but he was with Pittsburgh. If I moved in, he'd hit one over my head. If I moved back, he'd hit one in front of me. It's a hard thing to do. He also took, uh, Phil took, uh, I, I got a brand new set of bats in, and there, the handles were a little bit too thick. And uh, so I, Phil said, I can I can have those fixed. I have a lathe them, and uh, we'll get them uh, shaved down. And so he took you know, all my bats. Uh, so about two, three weeks later, I said, Phil, where are my bats? And he says, Terry, I am so sorry. Carol sold them in an auction. Terry, <laughs> <laughs> one thing that I knew about you tonight when you're hitting, you were just there, you know, it's looked at as a as function center. When you keep talking about defense, what about your hitting? What about your secret? So you're looking at a player that went through two different styles of hitting, really. You know, I was, when I first came up, I was more of a front foot hitter. And then once they start saying that this guy can hit the bat for them, he starts throwing breaking balls and change-ups and everything. And, you know, it almost, uh, you know, I have to reteach myself with the help of Dennis Menke to stay on the back side. <laughs> so I literally hit two different ways. In my career, which really helped me down at UHV when I was uh, coaching, because I could cut through a lot of the red tape with the pluggers when you know, I see them hitting, and I go, huh, "That's not going to work." Yeah, it might work if you're at high school and a lower college, but if you want to play and hit at a high level, you have to have a short swing. I think one of the greatest swings I've ever seen is Barry Bonds. You know, that was a short swing, and. Uh, uh, which I can't believe he's on the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, hitting is, takes an incredible amount of work. It's a lot about confidence. If, if you feel like you're in a good group, you're going to hit. You know, it's, uh, I think uh, um, when you struggle, you sometimes see these guys look like they're, they're you know, like deer staring in the headlights. You know, so they've, they've completely lost. It. And you can go through those times to hit it. It's, you know, but you got to go back out there. I'll tell you a funny story about that. We are playing Pittsburgh Pirates, and Willie Starkin was there. And he, Willie came up to me before, and I was struggling a little bit at that time. And he said, Terry, he says, I see something that you're doing. That he said, I did as a young hitter. He says, you were both left-handed hitters. He says, you're not turning your head enough because you're not looking at it both your eyes. You just you're just turning a little bit, and you're just looking out of one of your eyes. He said that's what he did. He says turn your head, and so I I did that. The first at bat, we play him. He's playing first base. <laughs> that's throws the ball. Now I hit a line drive right up the middle. Now I get down to first base. Willie Stargell is happier than I am. <laughs> In fact, when he was at, uh, we went to Nolan Ryan's Hall of Fame, that uh, they, they have all these Hall of Fame guys at Cooperstown, a different location. And Willie Stargell had about a half a block long line to, to get his autograph. And I took my two boys, I said, we're standing in this line because you are going to meet Willie Stargell. 
And we got there, just finally got to the front of the line, and Willie was much about two years before he passed away. And, uh, he was a big man. <laughs> and I, I, know, I walked up and I said, Willie, Terry fooled me. And he, looked, he jumped up and he came around, and gave me a big hug. And, you know, I got to, he, my two boys got to meet us. You know, one of the great men in baseball. Yes. What, what picture did you like to bat? Or, or did you get in which one did you like to bat? Well, you know, that's, that's a good question. Uh, it cut me off when you, when you think that I need to stop and come down, right? Can I answer the question? Yeah. But Steve Rogers with the Montreal Expo, I wore him out early in my career. I mean, I came out of every game two, three hits every time. And I went back home to Canada during the winter. I was doing an interview, and somebody asked me that same question. I said, without question, Steve Rogers. I never got another hit. <laughs> Yeah, you got to have at least one question. I don't want to hear one question. <laughs> I, 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 you know, one thing I did appreciate for, for you as a general manager, because a lot of general managers, we know where they sit up in the suites. And we used to have a general manager yes. later yes. on that we saw chairs flying across the way. <laughs> 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 but, yeah. How do you compare it to today's games? Yeah, you play. Well, the, the game, uh, at least with, with the hitters, the hitters are elevating their swing. They're, you know, I, I've fought a lot of these guys in college that says you, you want to elevate the ball. They're trying to put backspin on the ball, put the ball up in the air, put the ball up in the air. And a lot of them lose the capability of their speed. And most of them, I would say about 95% of them, don't have the power to hit it out the other way. So they're an out. They're an out. And I said, you, you, you can't get it through their heads. These major leaguers are 240 pounds, 220 pounds. They're solid. They're six foot five. And yeah, they can do that. They can get it out. But it, but I, I see, you know, like for instance, uh, Verlander, you know, he figured that out. You know, he figured he could he could pitch up in the strike zone. Well, what did all the hitters do? And this is what all good hitters do. If you're, you stay in the big leagues, you have to adjust. You have to adjust. Because they're gonna, you know, they're gonna try to get you out of the way, and you gotta show that you can hit the ball away, and then they're gonna come in on you. So you come always adjusting. It's a cat and mouse game. And now the hitters have adjusted a little bit to Verlander pitching up in the strike zone. And now you, you know, if he's not, and if he doesn't have a good 97, 98 mile an hour fastball, which we didn't see too much of late, <laughs> and he got hurt up there. And so well, unless he gets out, but that's why Javier he's pitch up there. You know, he's got that little yeah. bit of a jump on. Gary, do you think the shifting rules that are going into effect next year are going to make much difference in the game? Yeah, I think it will be. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I see so many balls that when they're off the bat, I say, well, it's a base hit. Especially, you know, uh, but some guys don't take advantage. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot to, to learn, but they're taught to pull the ball and you know, keep on pulling the ball. But it'll speed up the game. No, no question about it. It'll speed it up. Um, yeah, I think it'll make, I think the batting average will increase a little bit. <laughs> yes. Good question. I grew up in Texas. When, we, when did you find time to learn how to play baseball coming to Canada with the weather? And second question is, who's the best ball player you played with? that I played with? Um, well, best ball player I thought that I've ever played with Cesar today. Uh, I mean, uh, Cesar had some injury issues, but as for uh, a physical specimen, there's no comparison to what we've ever seen. This guy was a beast. <laughs> I would yeah, absolutely he, agree. He was the most talented player the Astros have ever had. Yeah. As a result of injuries and other factors, then his accomplishments were not as great as Bagwell and Vigio or Hartman, a number of other people, but he was the greatest talent we had. And he, and there were others that read that, but he was Willie Mays. And, uh, and a close second after that, I think, it would have been Dickie Thon. Dickie Thon was kind of quite a player. 
And uh, of the pitchers, of course, no one is in there. And and uh, J.R. Richard was the most did. I used to hate hitting off the him at Spring Crane. He put you in the slump in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Astros have had some some fine players, but those those three I think are the elite. Is there a lot of baseball in Canada? Uh, well, the, there was when I played. You know, it's, it's just high school baseball. You know, it's a, I got down here. I had good coaching. I played every day. I was seventeen years old, so I got a lot of games. Really, I got up to be real quick. But that, that's that was it's me getting out of Canada at an early age to get down here. If I would have come out of college. Uh, there's been no chance. No chance. I was very interested in, in your comments about your own development. We hear a lot today about the emphasis on player development, and farm systems, and, and staffs are so much greater. Well, major league staffs, when I started off, it was like a long, long time ago, we had a manager and two coaches for major league level. Today, the Giants have what, eight, ten coaches or something? Like that. Major, they say the same thing in the minor leagues. You've got all the all the added instructions. But uh, as I would please and sense that you felt from your own career that you got sufficient help to get to the big And guys that taught me how to throw, you know, these are all in the minor leagues too. Swing. Jim Beachman uh, helped me a lot. If Triple A would, you know, uh, he was a big leader for 12 years himself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a little bit different where back then you had you had coaches that became career minor league coaches and they knew the game. Mm -hmm. they, they, they knew what to help the players with. You don't have to, you're not going to take a player and make a 250 hitter into a 320 hitter. You're not going to do that. But you can take a 275 hitter and make an HGHC 320 hitter. And it doesn't take much. You know, like Beecham. You showed me a few things. I did you know, Leo Posada had this thing about holding a bat, and he would have he had he put my thumb over my third finger when I hit. You know that's how he, because he thought you could release your hands better that way. I get to Jim Beecham, and as he's watching me hit the first time, he says, "What are you doing?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, I, I don't know what you're doing." And he says, you've got your thumb over your third finger. He says, get that thumb where it's supposed to be. I said, well, I can't hit that way because I've been hitting like that for about a year and a half. And, and he says, he says, if I see you hitting with your thumb over there, you're not playing. So I learned how to do it. It's not a big thing, just little things. Base running is a huge thing in, in uh, Enos Cabell. Enos Cabell was the greatest, I thought, was the greatest base runner on our team. He, I told Howard Cosell beat him up in that 80, you know, about rounding, but he probably took a wide turn. But Enos Cabell taught us how to be the, the contact play at third base, you know, how to, how to run it properly so you could score on, a, on, a, on an infield ball with the infield almost drawn in. And there are not too many guys that are doing it. Yes. I was very interested in your explanation of your defensive skills. You were aware at the time you had the major league record outfielder for the best percentage defense for 150 games. The baseball started, you had the record. So, what, the last couple of years? But I, I knew I had a, a, a high fielding percentage, but you know, it's, you know, it's, it, all it was is just. Habits, that's all it was. It wasn't like I was doing it. I never thought of it. You no, know, it just happens. At the end, you listen, you go 18 errors. And, uh, I still blame them. my buddies. We went to Chicago. Uh, it was in 78. And, and uh, there was a ball. I was playing center field with that day. And Joaquin Andahar was pitching. It was the first game. And we had gone out and had a few extra cervezas. But the boys and you know, you know how the Canadians like to drink, and so we ball was hit a line drive to me. It was like one hop. Now, I swear to this day, that ball took a bad bounce, it hit me off the chest, and I got an error on that play. So, I you know, every time I, I talk to give any kind of talks up in Canada, and anybody, one of those guys who are at them, I always make them stand up in the crowd first. So, I says, Yeah. I had 18 here, but they cost me one of them. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, there's another thing right there where I just said that. Your extracurricular activities as a player. I saw so many players put been, you know, some of those names have been mentioned in this room today. Uh, but uh, you have to take care of yourself. And I think that I think players today take better care of themselves than we do, than, than what uh, in my era. Uh, you have to get your rest. You have to eat properly. You cannot get hits unless you eat cheeseburgers. <laughs> Craig Reynolds. Craig Reynolds, I have to say something about Craig. Craig and I, we, we roomed together for 10 years. Finally, we got to be making enough money. We had a joining room. So, you know, we, <laughs> but uh, Craig is closer than a, uh, is closer than a brother. Than me. And uh, to this day, if I get a phone call at 11.30 at night, it's probably Craig Reynolds. <laughs> and so he's one of the, the true gentlemen in the game, but... Uh, I, I love him to death, and he had a big impact on my other parts of the mountain. One of them, you know, being my uh, my relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, Craig is a pastor up at uh, uh, Second Baptist uh, at their team. Yeah. Great friend. You got, you got to tell me when I got it, because I know there's another gentleman there. Hey, does, uh, does anybody online have a question for uh, Terry? Yes. Uh, go ahead. Whoever's first, Maxwell, Mark, doesn't matter. You want to go first or you want me to go first? You talking ahead, to me? Max. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Maxwell, then Mark. All go right. Ahead, Max. I've got a picture here showing uh, Terry rounding third and heading for home, being approached by Jose Cruz, Craig Reynolds, Phil Garner, and Alan Ashby. Right. I don't care. I don't know if you can see the picture, but what yeah, do you remember it. about? What do you remember about that game and that home run? Yeah, that was a game. That was against the Mets, and uh, who was their closer at that time? It was uh, they had a nasty curveball. But anyways, the score five to one. Great score, five to one in the bottom of the ninth with two out. No, so he's a right hand. Roger McDowell. Roger McDowell. Um, you did oh. not play this crucial. Hey, Joe. Well, Scurry Burton is trying to say something, I think, but he doesn't have a body moment. He's muted. Oh. Yeah, but that, that, that home run with two outs in the bottom of the night, oh, game at 5 5, we lost the next race. Okay. My next grand slam was up in Montreal, we lost that game. <laughs> I did hit a third one, and we did. And the third one was off of Oral Hershaw's. Okay, now you got to hear me. Oral Hershaw was his last start in Houston, and uh, he ended up was he was winning the ERA title. We dropped eight earned runs on. Him. <laughs> he lost the ERA. <laughs> 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 Loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Grand slam against the bike. Uh, I hit two home runs with one game against. I twice I did it over there. And both of them, one was off of uh, Bill Necro. You know, the great knuckleballer. Yeah. All you got to do is, you know, take the knuckleballer until really he throws a strike. I'm not, I can't get it. Why would I say <laughs> so that when he goes two and oh, he has to throw that nothing little sinker. So then you get on top of the plate and you look for it up. When he gets up, it's like batting hard. <laughs> <laughs> I got two home runs up. I also hit a line drive off of Joe, uh, Phil Micro uh, uh, in Atlanta. I hit him right in the cup. Oh, and the ball goes back between first and home plate. And I get to first base. And he goes down, of course, it's the, everybody comes down, and then they take him off. And then about five minutes later, here comes Bill Nico, running back on him. Yeah, and, and, run and he starts punching again. Okay. And okay. after the game, I called him. I said, you okay? He says, Terry, he said, when you hit that, you shattered my cup. <laughs> he said, I, 
pieces all over the place. Oh, I don't know what takes. <laughs> Or Joe Nico was probably one of his. He, I mean, he had a couple of years there. He was the best pitcher of baseball. Mark? Mark okay. Mark. Yes, Terry, uh, Mark here. I have a trivia question for you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Against which pitcher did you have the highest career batting average, minimum 45 at bats? Uh, probably Tom Seaver. Dang, that's some, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and it, do you know, do you know what that average was? Twenty two. Oh my God! It was four forty four. Four forty four. Twenty for forty five. I saw Tom Seaver at the back end of his career. <laughs> he was, okay, he was maybe that's it. Upper eighties pitcher. I saw. Anyone else? Perfect. I got. I got one. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the nineteen eighty National League Championship Series kind of puts you on the map. I think it was a great series. Uh, I wanted to know how you all felt when Cesar Sedano got hurt. And did you play center field from that point forward? I did. Yes, yeah, so I was playing right field. I've noticed yeah. center field. Uh, that's a. That's a. Uh, your big shoes to fail, uh, fill in. But I always felt with Cesar, we could always match up. He was our superstar. And so it didn't matter who, you know, they had Steve Carlton, we had Cesar sitting. Well, it didn't matter. And that's why I always felt with Cesar on the team. You know, it's like, you know, we, as, you know, the other parts of the, of the team, we could do our thing. But Cesar was our leader. You know, even though he, you know, but, because he was such a great player. So, Cesar taught me how to play the outfield up there. You know, he would whistle at me when I first came up the left field. He'd whistle at me. He said, TP, move in two steps. I move in two steps, and you know, you go like, okay. And sure enough, you did you in a position. And I also learned with Cesar, you know, a ball in the alley, he never called the ball. Never came. He came over and he just listened to the chains. <laughs> when you heard the chains coming, it was cleared out of the way. <laughs> Any you know, talk his name with the floor. You know, Neil LaFleur had that thing going on, you know, because uh, LaFleur, LaFleur got a base hit on Cesar. And I remember going over and I was watching LaFleur and he grounded first goal and second. I said, CC, two, two, two. And you now he got into second base safe. He was on a regular base hit. And that Sedano was just irritated, uh, just absolutely irritated with this. Well, Sedano came up and he got a base hit and he tried to stretch it in. And LaFleur threw him out by about 20 feet. He tried to make that crazy hook, hook slide off wow. his knee. I was like, it was such a shame. You know, just, uh, you know, say, say sorry. He would show up with the Nautilus equipment at the end uh, at the, before we leave for spring training. We'd all be there working January, February, you know, the parts of November. He'd show up the, the one week before spring training. He'd put the, the peg into the bottom of the plates and he'd go 20 of them, boom, 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 boom. boom. And we'd all be looking at him like, look at this Now, how can you do that? You know, it's a incredible effort. Incredible. Well, should be the last question, I think, too. Okay. okay. How was it? How did you like playing on AstroTurf? Uh, AstroTurf was good for me, you know, because, uh, uh, especially in the Astrodome, because the conditions were always the same. You know, once you got used to seeing the ball in the, in the lights or in the windows at the dome, you had to be careful during a day game. Night game, you hit the ball up in the air, it better be out of the stadium because I'm going to catch it. Uh, because that's how that's how good you can get on that on uh, in the astronaut. On the other fields, it's completely different animal. The, the early uh, turf fields were very hard. You know, Philadelphia, St. Louis, uh, they, they just beat your feet up because the shoes weren't as good. When we get to Dodger Stadium and they had grass, you go, oh gosh, it's feels so good on the feet. So it was hard to play on those fields. San Francisco had a really hard. Turf until O.J. Simpson 
one sign there and they put grass in there for him. He wouldn't go, he wouldn't sign it. Willie McCovey hit me a ball at San Francisco. I was playing left field and you know they got the wind and everything. They said, if you can play the outfield in San Francisco, you can play outfield. And he hit a ball so high that I was I was under in left field. I was literally camped underneath the ball. And then the wind got it. And I started running and I was in a full and I dove right behind Fred Reynolds the shortstop and made the catch. And there's no way I was gonna drop that ball after I was camped or anything. San Francisco was a tough place. I want to thank you for your attention. Well, Willie Starkville may have a long line of sign. Well, so do we. <laughs> so, uh, oh, sure. Okay. Um, oh, I have a, do you want to take a, take a, we could just go right on. Go right on. <laughs> All right. Um, next up, we have, uh, John Racanelli. John? Hello, John. How's it going, Joe? Good to just see you. Just fine, just fine. Good. Um, John has a very interesting uh, topic he'd like to talk about. Something that affects everybody in this room. And something that I think, as a chapter, all of you should take advantage of. John, is that a good enough introduction for you? Perfect. <laughs> well, John, if you don't know, John's a Chicago lawyer. He's an insatiable interest in baseball history and baseball-related litigation. When not rooting for the Cubs or working, he is probably reading a baseball book, researching or writing his next blog post, planning his next baseball trip, or enjoying downtime with his wife and family. He is probably, and John wrote this, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> he is probably the world's foremost photographer of triple peanuts found at ball games, and likes to think he has one of the most complete collections of vintage handheld electronic baseball games known to exist. It's John's word. <laughs> he is a member of the Chicago Sabre chapter and founder and co-chair of the Sabre Landmarks Research Committee. And he's an active member of the Sabre Baseball Cards Committee. Uh, interesting, you mentioned Dickie Thon. Uh, the Hall of Fame uh, has a brief little article about Dickie and his uh, baseball card. I just, uh, I just glanced at it today, so... Uh, you know, I might have to go back and look at that. So, without further ado, John. All right, thanks. Tell us about your project. Thank you. I, pre I appreciate you giving me a chance to kind of go over the Landmarks Committee and our Sabre Baseball Map with everybody down in Houston. Um, just like a lot of people that get to the end of their baseball career, um, you probably hope that it ends with the Astros. I'm no different. Uh, my team, when I was 16, the very last time I played ball was for the uh, National Bank of LaGrange Astros. Um, I had three hits as a 16-year-old and decided it was about the time that I should hang it up. I spent way too much time over this weekend going through my closet in the basement trying to find a picture of me in my Astros uniform. I couldn't find it, so I'm sure you're all pretty disappointed about that. But I really do appreciate the chance to kind of talk about the Landmarks Committee. And I don't know who's familiar with it or not. I just thought we could kind of go through, if I could share my screen, um, a quick little presentation here about what's, what it's all about. Are you able to see the PowerPoint? No, no we can't see anything. No. Um, is there something? That needs to be done maybe to help me share my screen. It should be a uh, icon near the bottom. It's on the bottom of our screen. I don't to be on the bottom of yours. You should share screen. Okay. Maybe near the top. Green. Green. Screen. 
There you go. Yeah, now we got it. We got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. So I'm not sure who has heard of or has used the baseball map. Uh, we went live in July after having over 50 people volunteer to try and vet all of the information we had. And basically what we're doing here is trying to put together a list and a map of all of the baseball related sites and attractions across North America and beyond. Um, we have some stuff in Puerto Rico, we have some stuff in Canada. Um, I know there's somebody that's volunteered to do Japan. So at some point in the future, it'd be nice to have a worldwide database and map. But basically what we're trying to do here, and I'll, I'll apologize here for the Nolan Ryan picture. I know that's a Rangers I, I, uh, statue. I apologize for that. I, I've never been to Houston, so I didn't have anything Houston-wise to put up, so I apologize for that. But basically, we're just looking for Sabre members um, to visit, verify, document different baseball sites. Um, we're looking to foster collaborative relationships. And just like this one, Joe, thank you for inviting me to come on and talk about this. We're trying to get everybody at the local chapter level to kind of share, maybe rank, whatever the must-see baseball sites in your area would be. Uh, we've started the baseball map and we're maintaining it at this point, not only for Sabre members, but everybody that's a baseball fan can look at it to see whether they want to, on a baseball trip that they're planning, find some things along the way to go see if they just happen to be out of town for vacation or business or even for a day trip. And there's something along the way that uh, maybe they could go take a look at and finally, we're looking to get with photographs, basically to document a case of future loss and destruction. And at this point, there's a lot of historical markers and statues and murals and so forth that um, are in disrepair or maybe are stolen or broken or missing and so forth. And we just kind of want to preserve that for the future too. So basically everything on the Sabre baseball map is going to be active ballparks. This is everything from major league, affiliated minor league, indie ball, uh, college wood bat teams, historic ballparks that may not be in use for an active professional or wood bat league, but are still standing. Um, Astrodome is a perfect example of one of these. Historical markers that have been placed for people and events and ballparks and so forth. Uh, statues that are baseball related, murals, public art, uh, museums, permanent exhibits at local historical societies that have to do with baseball. And uh, especially at the major league level, walks of fame, wall of fame, team hall of fame, those kinds of things. We want to document all of those. Uh, ballplayer grave sites, historic homes, recognizable filming locations, and then kind of other attractions and photo opportunities. So if you haven't already seen the Landmarks Committee landing page, this is on the Sabre website. You can go there and to join the committee, you go up to that box where it says announcements, click on that, you sign in and it gives you an opportunity to join. That will allow you to get all the email updates that we have and uh, we'll give you better information about how to contribute. Um, you can also contact us in the middle there with any questions. We have a frequently asked questions section there too that'll hopefully explain a little bit better what's going on. And this is a place where you can access the baseball map itself. You can see it there, you click on the image, it'll take you right to that. And then if you scroll down on this page, there's also some videos and a demonstration of the map that'll kind of give you some tips and tricks on how to use it. Um, I think Bill Perch from Chicago is on the call with us. And he was really helpful in not only verifying sites initially, but uh, was the cameraman and executive producer for the video that we put together. So I hope you have a chance to look at it and enjoy it. So if you've never seen the baseball map, basically it's something that you can use on a computer, your desktop, your laptop. You can use it on your phone or your tablet. Um, it's customable, customizable by type of site, and we'll kind of go through it in a couple of minutes here. Um, it gives you options to, based on where you are, 
choose the nine nearest locations. And when you put it onto your phone, it is going to give you turn by turn directions when you have Google Maps on. So I'm going to try now to pop out of this and get into screen sharing the map itself. Okay, so the easiest way to find it if you're looking for the map and you don't have the Sabre website up, just Google Sabre baseball map. Um, it should hopefully come up pretty quickly. I don't know if it's only because I use it all the time that it's the top of my list. So let's go here, Sabre baseball map, open it up. And essentially it's just gonna give you all the sites that we've compiled so far. If you see along the left-hand side here, there's different boxes you could check. So say for instance, all you wanna look at are college wood bat teams. If you click that, then that shows only the orange pins and that'll show you all the different college wood bat leagues across the country and we're, we're still adding more. But I just thought what we could do is kind of just go to Texas So if you type that in at the top there, it's going to show you not only the state of Texas, but other places that must have Texas in their name. Um, this one, for instance, anything that's in the Texas League is going to pop up there. Um, that's the team in Arkansas. But if we kind of zoom into Houston, I think I saw something recently that compared the state of Rhode Island to being very similar in size to the Houston metro area. So I'm not exactly sure if this is an easy drive for you or not, but if you kind of zoom in, you're gonna see there's different color spots here. So this one here, there's the Astrodome. And it's pretty cool. So if you hit Street View, now it's gonna take you right inside. So you're able to see what it looks like from the inside. If you go out here, here's uh, if you kind of zoom in. Here is the cemetery where Dickie Kerr is buried, and this should be pretty close to where the actual headstone is. And if you know Dickie Kerr, he was 2000 or I'm sorry, 1919 Black Sox, one of the honest pitchers on the White Sox. <clears throat> There's also going to be as we zoom out here. Uh, Buff Stadium. And this is one of the things I wanted to talk about. Joe kind of asked, you know, what was some way that the chapter could be involved? This one, when we first put the list together, used to be, I think it was called the Fingers Furniture Store. And within, yeah. the, so with, within that store was a home plate marker where Buff Stadium used to be. But as I look at it now, it looks like that business has gone out of business and the Building's been raised. So one of the things that we would love to have is somebody that's close by there can verify that that marker is no longer there, which I'm assuming based on what we're seeing here, it's not, but maybe can do a little detective work and find out maybe where it's at, if it was relocated or if it's in storage or something like that. And I don't know exactly how far Elvin is. I think it's not too far, right? I mean, a little bit of a drive, 40 minutes or so from central Houston. But one of the questions that we have is we've got two different spots here where there's supposed to be a Nolan Ryan statue. This one here shows in front of the city hall building. This one shows in front of the Alvin Historical Museum. When I hit street view, yeah, I mean, that's there. So Nolan's there, but when I go to the other one, it's not there. So this is one of those things too that all of the verification that we've kind of done up to this point, unless we had somebody local to that particular city, has all really kind of been done with just using Google Maps and searching online. And when we go to this one here and go to Street View, I'm not seeing one there. I can't imagine there would be two that close together, but this is just one of the things that we're hoping that 
each chapter can kind of maybe help us with is to verify within their geographical area that each of the places is still there or if it's been moved where it's been moved to because what used to or what it used to be was I believe this was all at the Alvin Community College it used to be a, a permanent exhibit or a Nolan Ryan Museum or something that was there I believe it's been moved so these are the kind of things that we need help with and there's another one here it's West End Park where there's a marker. Or this one, Balance as you can see, it shows on here the location of it, that it's a marker. There's really not much more there. When I go to Street View, that's electrical state. Yeah, that's that's it's right here. So it's basically the Allen Center. There's the yeah, right. there's the marker right there. Yeah. No. There's the marker. Right there. So what we're trying to do is, uh, for instance, State. If we yeah. just yeah. zoom out and I'll, I'll go to yeah. Illinois only because I know that I've Jackie, Jackie put in a lot of the information here for Illinois. But if we look at markers here in Chicago, There's one for the Wrigley House. I don't have a photo in there yet. Here's the Roberto Clemente mural that's on the wall of a high school. And I've got the photo in there. I've got a little bit more information about where it's at. Um, you can see that's my photo. So I gave myself credit for doing that. And what we're trying to do with each of the pop-up boxes is get more information about what's at that site and get a picture of it so that when somebody's using the map, they're able to go to it and they see exactly what it is. So another cool thing about the Landmarks Committee is we just launched within the last couple of months here, a blog, it's called a Hardball Voyager. And basically what we're trying to do there is get people to write something, whether it's as simple as, a single picture and a couple of sentences about, hey, I went and I saw this particular place. You can see it's here, it's at the saberlandmarks.com. And if you go there, I believe we've, we've got um, maybe seven or eight articles so far, ranging from um, a guy, Matt Albertson, out in Philadelphia actually had a hand in placing a marker for Philadelphia ballparks on Jefferson Street. Um, Andy Tarek in Pennsylvania did an article about his favorite marker that's uh, placed at PNC Park in Pittsburgh. And so what we're trying to do is get people to write about things that are important to them, that they have pictures of that they visit in and so forth. And I kind of look at it as a way to, if you've never written anything or published anything with Sabre, we're pretty, pretty lax. I mean, what we're really looking for are personal stories about this is something that's important to me. This is something that I think everybody that's visiting Houston should go see. Maybe it's a little bit off the beaten path. Or there might be things that, for instance, don't necessarily qualify to be placed on the actual official map, but you think would be significant and maybe interesting to people visiting the area they might wanna come see. Okay. So if you look at the list here, I kind of went through a bunch of different prompts. You know, What's your favorite landmark? How you discovered it? What does it mean to you? Um, this one, the next one, I think the top five or 10 baseball sites, baseball fans should see, I think is a perfect thing for a chapter to discuss. I know we're planning to do that at a future Chicago chapter meeting. Um, baseball landmark that's closer to you geographically or emotionally, why it's special to you. Um, any baseball landmarks near you that nobody knows about, including us. If we wanna have the most complete map of baseball sites across the country and the world. So if you know about something that's not on the map, please get in contact with us. You can find all that information on our site, on our Sabre uh, landing page. Um, travel log and photos. 
from your baseball trip. Um, if you're like me and say, for instance, what your entire year sometimes might revolve around is planning a baseball trip where you're going to see ballparks, maybe you're visiting factories or breweries or distilleries along the way. Or maybe you want to make sure that you see a specific thing for a specific player or a specific team. All of that information would be something perfect for a blog post. Show us your pictures, brag about where you went, uh, brag about all the things you saw, uh, national parks, great, uh, ballparks, great. Everything that you enjoyed on your vacation is something that we would love to see. Um, if you've paid your respects at the grave of a ball player or you've experienced baseball kind of in a far away or unusual location, I think a lot of people, Joe, you mentioned earlier your bucket list, I think a lot of people probably have the Midnight Sun game up in Alaska on their bucket list. So if you've ever been up there and you've got some pictures you want to share, it would be kind of the perfect thing to put on the Hardball Voyager website. And basically just at a chapter level, um, we're just looking involve the chapter members providing in-person verification, information, and photos for each of these sites. Um, you can also coordinate visits to go see something as a chapter, learn more about, uh, you know, West End Park or find out information about the Astrodome and maybe get a, a tour. I'm sure you guys have probably thought about all these things already, but if it's maybe somewhere out of the ordinary or something that you hadn't thought about, maybe it's something to do as a chapter too. Um, like I said earlier, you can discuss and rank, compile the top 10 list for places in your area that you would tell people, yeah, you're coming to Houston, you've got to see this if you're a baseball fan. You could create an actual tour itinerary or checklist with that. And there was some mention, I think, in the introduction that the Sabre Grants Program does have the opportunity for people in certain areas to place markers where they're deserving. Uh, we just, we have a, a blog post that'll be up soon about one that was done in Florida. Um, There's another one in Pittsburgh that I mentioned to Andy before. I think he might have been involved in uh, helping with that. Sabre has money available to you to place markers where significant baseball events occurred or significant baseball people are from or a ballpark might have stood in the past. And then otherwise, we're just looking to help us make corrections and additions and contribute to the hardball voyager. We want to hear from you guys. So I'm hoping that in the next couple of weeks here, at least see an article or two, or at least send us a query. Is this something that you think would be appropriate and something like that? So basically, if you want to get involved uh, to find the map, just Google Saber Baseball Map. For the blog, like I said, you can find it. It's just at saberlandmarks.com. If anybody's on Twitter, well, it still exists, I think, at this point. Uh, please join Saber Landmarks. Uh, if you post something and you tweet at us, we will retweet it. And I'm hoping to see everybody um, involved in some way or form. And if you need to contact any of us, it's me and Chris Kampka and Mark Armour. We're all involved in the uh, leadership of the committee. But I'm hoping uh, kind of in a short and quick manner that uh, gave you a little taste of what the Mini is all about. I'm hoping that if you haven't used the Saber baseball map yet, that you'll go find it, check it out, play around with it a little bit, help us determine whether we have everything we need on it. Mm -hmm. and hopefully it'll spark some conversation in the chapter to figure out whether you've, we've got everything that we should know about in Houston and whether there's anything on there that maybe you think is worthy of maybe a group visit or something. So I do appreciate your time. I'm assuming you don't um, have as many questions for me about my Astros career, but if you do <laughs> want to ask me anything, uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Right. Any questions for John? I have a question about the uh, baseball card thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What? Yeah. Baseball card. And then, uh, yeah, about baseball cards? Yeah, didn't he? Wasn't that your intro? Yes. I'm a oh. big baseball card collector. Uh, basically, Cubs team sets, 
and uh, a handful of other stuff. I have uh, a fair amount of Terry Pool cards. Again, I wish I would have pulled them out, but I couldn't find them right away. Can you show us a picture of that triple peanut? Uh, let me see. <laughs> <laughs> I Maybe if I could find it on my phone here. Uh, yeah, here's, yeah, here's what I have. Um, I don't know if you could really see it. I've got the thumbnail here. Um, so I don't know if you're able to see this or not, but basically when I go to a ballpark, I get a bag of peanuts. If I find a triple peanut, I take a picture of it. And this just kind of started as a fun thing with my, my younger son. We would always compete to see who would get the most triple peanuts at a ball game. And I went to a game without him. I took a picture of it. I sent it to him as a, ha, look what I found. And years later, I'm kind of now at oh, hundreds of these. <laughs> so I don't know. It's just kind of something fun and quirky. That I like to do. Buy, do you buy more at Wrigley or Kaminsky? <laughs> I, to be honest with you, I have gotten to the point where I like my own peanuts and I bring them with me. So usually if I'm buying... Uh, the Hampton Farms Jumbo plug for Hampton Farms. Um, usually they have a fair amount of triples on them. So that's that's my go-to. Mike, your question was about Sabre baseball card? Yeah, there's a Sabre baseball card thing. Is there, there a Sabre one. baseball card? There's a Sabre baseball card committee, yeah. Yes, okay. there's, a, there's a committee. And there's also a Sabre baseball cards blog. So if you are interested you in reading about baseball cards, if you're interested in writing about baseball cards, um, if you find, I think it might just be saberbaseballcards.com or saberbaseballcards.org. I'm not exactly sure right off the top of my head what it is, but yes, definitely look for it. If you search on mine or if you want me to, um, I could email Joe with the information too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. All right, thanks, Thank John. You. Thank you so much. Uh, we, uh, I personally feel like this is something the chapter can uh, get more involved in, but hey, that's me. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. All right, um, we have a trivia contest. Don't go anywhere because the winner gets uh, this World Series champion lapel pin. Mm -hmm. If you don't have one, I'll come on now. <laughs> <laughs> And one of our newest chapter members, Patrick, won the trivia contest last month. So if you uh, are relatively new to our uh, chapter, hey, Patrick is the example of somebody that can win one right when he joined. In fact, I think one of the few ones I won was right after I joined, but that was 13 years ago. <laughs> so here we go, Patrick. Diabolical Chris Chestnut trivia quiz. So the uh, theme this month went with was uh, Cranes and Astros history. No, uh, Tal was joining us, but, uh, but that's going to be the theme here. So, yeah, you know, choice. Hey, you're allowed to pair up for three of them. Thank you. And I just want to say, uh, Scott, I haven't seen you in a long time. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you. If y'all don't know Scott, Scott Margo, you run another bus. Hey, trying to know those? Yeah, let me that, guys. By the way, uh, one, one other thing of note, and uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to Terry about this. But I did get a chance to talk to Brownie about this, and he says this looks genuine. I found this on Amazon. It's called Baseball Swing with Terry Poole. Bill says it looks genuine. So uh, I'll pass this around. You know, y'all want to look at it. He didn't get a chance to autograph it, but, you know, very, very good. Oh. I heard what I got at the end. Okay. So we'll go through the uh, questions quick here. So uh, question one, the Astros have had four different Cy Young Award winners in their history. Uh, which two were acquired via trade? So two names, a couple questions here that are uh, two name answers. 
Uh, speak slowly and clearly. You want to answer now? What? No, <laughs> go, go to him and I'll get the answer. Yeah. Hey, Mark, you want him to read the question? Uh, yeah, I cannot see that. Yeah, yeah uh, go ahead and read the question. We're, we're gonna, he's going to share it. Oh, he's going to share it. Okay. Can you see it now, Mark? Yes. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Right, after the 1991 season, the Astros made the smart decision to move Craig Biggio from catcher to second base. However, to fill the void at catcher, they made the decision to trade this future six time all star outfielder to Queen. Uh, question three, at the time of the trade from the Seattle Mariners, this pitcher had a career ERA of 9.53. He developed into an all-star with the Astros, posting 22 wins and a 2.9 ERA in 1999. No. Yeah. Uh, question four, one of the most lopsided trades in the history across all sports. These two players were also sent to Cincinnati in 1971 to finish the big run machine. Playing center field, one had nearly 150 doubles and scored over 400 runs in his nine years with the Reds. The other led the Reds and wins for three consecutive years. So this is another uh, two-namer. Uh. All right, number five, he pitched five hitless innings in the classic 1986 NLCS game six against the Mets, but is better known for the 1990 trade, which netted the Astros future Hall of Famer, Jeff Badwell. Five innings? Three. Three. Since their inception, the Astros have made the most trades with this story franchise. Apparently, trading within the division wasn't a concern as these two teams played in the same division from 1994 to 2012. Number seven, a mid-season acquisition. This outfielder helped the playoff push, hitting 23 home runs after joining the Astros. Had an October to remember when he batted over 450 and hit eight home runs, despite the Astros falling in seven games in the NLCS. Hmm. That one's for you, Jeff. <laughs> All right, these two players were sent to the Astros as part of the trade with the Orioles part of the 1991 season. Later in their careers, they became teammates again, winning the 2001 World Series with the Arizona Diamondbacks. All right, number nine, famous for his World Series heroics with the Yankees. This pitcher was traded to the Orioles in the second ever trade after the Colt 45s were renamed the Astros. Right there, According to baseball records, so that's what I Pitch for the Yankees, but he was traded to the Orioles. Or he he, he was, he's famous for his pitching for the Yankees, for his World Series runs with the Yankees. Was he was in a trade from the Orioles to the Astros. Once they, the second trade after the, they were renamed the Astros. He was traded to the Orioles? No. He was on the Astros, traded to the Orioles. Oh, yeah, sorry, trade to the Orioles, yeah. Stop in between. Yeah. <laughs> or is that one, you know, maybe. <laughs> 
All right, not as famous as other trades in Astros history. However, a big trade at the time brought this future Hall of Fame pitcher who went 10 1 during his time in Houston. Oh. Jordan Alvarez. I think Jordan should be every answer. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan Alvarez. Yeah. 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 Number 11, just days after acquiring Lee May in the lot side of Joe Morgan trade, this future all-star first baseman was shipped off to Kansas City. What was another disastrous trade for the Astros? Turns out it wasn't really disastrous after all. All right, the last one. Uh, two members of a famous baseball family, both outfielders, were involved with trades to join the Astros nearly 30 years apart. Both trades were memorable for being particularly one-sided. The first trade was an awful one for the Astros, and the second trade ended up very favorable for the Astros. So, two names here. Hmm. You can back up if you guys online and see another one. Uh, one for each one. Baseball family. Both Big way. Oh, Big way. Not testing. Hmm. Okay. You want to have that PhD? Now, it didn't say they were Why yes, you really get it. All right. Yeah, what? What's that? Are we ready? Yeah. All right. You guys online ready to go the answers? Sure. All right. Question one. Yeah. The uh, two Cy Young pitchers. Verlander and Mike Scott. Verlander and Mike Scott. Question two. The outfielder or the outfielder that became an all-star in Cleveland. Came off. Came off. Pitcher who came from Seattle that then developed into an all-star. Mike Hampton. Mike Hampton. Are the two uh, players not named Joe Morgan? Tolan and Billy Gear. Not Geronimo. These are Geronimo. These are Geronimo. Yeah. All right. Pitcher who was traded for Jeff Bagwell. Larry, Larry Anderson. Anderson. The team the Astros made the most trades with? Uh, oh, yes. So the Dodgers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mid-season acquisition. You can't even see the trash can that picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the two players who were traded from Baltimore to the Astros and then gave teammates later on. Finley and Lee Schillings. Finley and Kurt Schillings. Oh, wow. That's true. All right. Pitcher who was famous for his World Series work with the Yankees was involved with the second ever trade after being renamed the Astros. Don uh, Larson. Don uh, Larson. Really? I got mine. Okay. All right, uh, pitcher went ten and one in his half season. Right. So. All star, future all star first baseman. Who was John Mayberry? John Mayberry. Helen John Mayberry. 
Yeah, that was Jimmy Wynn. How did you know? Oh, Jimmy Wynn. <laughs> it's okay. And the uh, two members of a famous baseball family involved with trades 30 years apart. Matt Hayes was the same. Who's the lowest? And Susan Moises. Oh, uh, okay. Susan, the uh, Rusty Style trade, and then Moises a little after the Marlins were trading everyone off in 97. What's my Mark, how many did you get? Awesome. I think she did. I didn't get uh, the last one, which you'll lose. I didn't get Steve Finley. What do you want to start at? Uh, what was that? 16. So, eight? Oh, come on. Card seven. I got seven. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, about eight or eight. Uh, ten. There you go, Scott. She's twelve. Oh, back, Scott. <laughs> twelve. Max Cook Canada's okay. representing. Uh, I know. Thirteen. Only twelve. Sixteen. Smart about six. Ten. Mm -hmm. so got 14. Oh, oh, oh Max put his hand down. That's right. What you got, Mike? 14 out of 15. 14 out of 16. 15. You're a for math skills. I thought he more crazy. So much. <laughs> So, Mike, uh, Mike, you want to? You and Tal work together? Uh, that's yeah, good. Yeah, that's good. Well, yeah. 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 Sure. yeah, that's a war on cigarettes. All right, everybody, great meeting. Uh, remember next month. We are having, hold on a second, I want to make sure I get the right day. Palm Beach. Oh, no, you don't have to say that on baseball. Remember on uh, 17th, we're having a Saturday morning uh, little get together. Talk about the the grants program stuff like that. We're gonna meet some more chapter members. Hopefully, we have a couple over here that can join, so they can join us that Saturday meeting, so they can tell us who they are and why they join. And then next month, we will meet here on the nineteenth with Tony Adams, StealingScandal.com, and David Vaught with his talk about Gaylord Perry and his new book. I just saw you. Everybody have a happy Thanksgiving. Let's give one big round of applause for the Houston Astros. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Perry Cole, wherever you are. Thank you all. Nice Thanksgiving. See you next month.